Which one? Uh, the three switches right there. The one. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let's get it started. I apologize, I got late. And uh, because of something going on on campus, they block, block off a lot of uh, parking spots where I had my permit. So I didn't know if I drove around. And, and in fact, uh, actually on Monday, I want to give a lecture. Some of you are here. Only a few of you are here. Um, the, the side story is after I give you a lecture, I went back to my car. There was a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so defeated. <laughs> and uh, it's from our own parking department. And they said, you are not supposed to park here. Anyway, I filed the appeal, so I don't know if it'll take me. So I hope I don't get tickets today. So I was a little nervous. There was one spot I thought I should park, but I still have fresh tickets in my pocket. So my wife would be really pissed off for every time I give a lecture, I get a ticket. So I drove longer uh, until I find a garage. I thought, no, they shouldn't give me tickets. So let me just show you, show you how little universities pay attention to professors, right? So you know, if I put a sign say I'm teaching today, I should be exempt by any tickets anywhere I park on campus. <laughs> So next time you, you see your um, university people, founder, whoever, you should tell them this is what a professor wants. They come to teach on time, should allow them to just drop the car anywhere campus for an hour. You know? Anyway, so years ago, I teach the uh, um, same thing at home. It took me half an hour to park. By the time I park, I feel it's meaningless to teach anyway. So, so today is 10 minutes, and I apologize. I was speaking faster, and you can follow me. So how did you guys do with the exam? Yesterday, a Monday. Good, good. I see a lot of smile, so you must do well. I haven't seen the great. Okay, I see people not here, so. Okay, so um, if you, we'll, we'll see what your score is. But, but this year, on average, you guys have done better than previous years in the first exam. And probably the second one, but, but take my words. The last one will not be easier. Can you can record what I just said. The last one will not be easier. You really have to study if you, if you are falling behind. And you should catch up. You think you're doing OK. You should work harder to make it better. And uh, because this is a changing class. Because one thing we don't want you guys to lose, loosen up too early is that as we go through the, the last third of the semester, um, things will pile up. And if I haven't said this before to everyone, I said it one more time. The last exam will contain a portion that covered the entire semester. That has been the case ever. So it will be third exam, you have two hours, I think you have longer time, cover last third, and cover entire, um, entire class. Okay, so only very few of you are here on Monday. So um, I know you're busy, so this is where we start on Monday. And for those of you who didn't know what we talked about before, uh, and go home and study yourself. All right, so I want to repeat for the benefits of people who are here on Monday. And the weather today is really good. I was wondering how many of you would show up today. Because normally, as I told you at the beginning, the number of students in a, in a classroom is inversely proportional to the temperature outside. The outside is very nice. And I wish I had 10 more minutes walking on the campus before coming. OK, so here's what we talked about last time. We began to discuss the solar sensory system, what's going on on your fingertip. We we'll talk about multiple receptors. Uh, look, should, should I warm in this? Is this on? Okay. Do we have a microphone for the room? No. Okay. I'll, I'll just yield. This is my. Oh, it's not my last lecture. I have two more cut. So if my voice is broken, so you will know for next one. Okay. So I'll try to yield uh, a little louder for students sitting on the back. Um, OK, so, so that's receptors. But all the receptors, each of the receptors is connected by the effluent fibers. Okay? And this is the list that we, we stopped last time. So there are 16 types of effluent fibers. Effluent means fibers going from the receptor into the brain. There are ones for vibration, for temperature, for, for the itch or feeling. And then the eighth efferent that we didn't talk about. Now, importantly to pay attention is that this is very different from, from, from auditory and the visual system. Here's just a question to just quickly 
to test whether you I remember what we talked about before. So in the art auditory system, how many type of efferent fibers? How many? There are efferent fibers, there are efferent fibers. How many type of efferent fibers? How many we talk about it? One? Right, you know, we'll talk about one. There are actually two, but we did not talk about this in class. There are two. There's that, but there's a lot more technical differentiation, so I skip it. But uh, primarily, we we'll talk about one type. That's one type. How many different fibers we talk about? How many types? <coughs> Zero, one, two, three, where? One. What is connect to? Out here, so. We won't talk about one. So, okay. Now, that's auditory system. In visual system, how many different, different fibers? Can you talk about that? What would be different fiber? Anyone? Then? How many? Okay, I'll leave this open. If you, no one knows it, it will be on the exam. Uh, how many different fibers? This you should know. The other one, or there's some details said. How many? Zero, one, two, three, four. How many? Are there different fibers in the visual peripheral? Anything goes from brain to retina? No, there's no different fibers. Okay. So, so I said in the last lecture, from here forward, since now you have opportunity to learn all three sensory systems, I'll begin to connect them. And at the end of the semester, there are two, three slots. I'll come back to summarize all of them. At the end of the semester, we would like you to be able to synthesize all sensory systems together. And that's your final uh, kind of understanding. Now, let's move on to talk about the other aspects of uh, some sensory processing. Why we have different fibers, and the different fibers have different sensory endings, right? They, they allow these different fibers to respond to specific environmental uh, energy. So we talk about the um, vibration, we talk about the temperature, we talk about the pain, and each, so far so on. So in the many sensory system, the specificity of your sensation is based on the sensitivity of receptive channels. So there's a channel-based system. Last week, one of the students asked a very good question about auditory system, whether we have different channels. For example, you hear pitch, you hear harmonic, you hear rhythms, right? They are not conveyed by different channels. So only one channel as inner hair so throughout your nerve. Those are properties computed by central nervous system on top of a channel. Whereas in contrast, here, in the somatic sensory system, the specificity of what we feel by our fingertip, right? Something hard, something soft, something cold, something warm, something pain, something itch, these are connected through different channels. That's one of the major difference <laughs> of coding, okay? And then this is, of course, those specificity is the base, basis for modality segregation. <coughs> and uh, they respond for different aspect of perception. So this is conceptually very different from auditory and uh, visual system, okay? Now, there are several things we, sh we can discuss uh, uh, today with, with the time we have. Uh, I'll choose a couple examples, and uh, we say, what do you use the hands for, okay? And you think about everyday life. What are your hands for? You use the hand to grab stuff, you use the hand to feel it, and if you're a blind person, you use the fingertip to read it, okay? So one of the important function for our somatic sensory system is to uh, process a form and a texture. Form means I hold it here, I know this is a round cubic like. I hold this iPhone, I know it's a square. Okay, that's form. And texture means if you put your finger on the table, you know this is wood, you know this is clothes, you know this is skin without looking. That's texture processing. Now, how does the sensory system process here? Okay, and then, uh, let me talk about some examples. Now, we begin with uh, receptive field, the concept we have discussed many times now. This is the one thing that you've seen uh, very earlier of my lecture, that each fingertip has a receptive field, and a receptive field has different size. Okay, I, th I believe in this year we did a test, one of you guys, uh, volunteer, we did this two-point discriminant task. That is, when I stick one or two points on your skin, you will be able to tell if two points are far, separate far enough, okay? But that also depends where, either in the here or in here. Because the receptive field are smaller here, your discriminability is better than here when the receptive field is larger, okay? That is the basis of us to tell that the surface of wood is different from the surface of your cloth, okay? Now, we also look at it here, that across your skin body, across your body, 
all skin parts and this is discrimination threshold and your fingers is small that means you are sensitive on the bike on the arm on, on your body and, and you are much larger you are do very poorly okay now uh, if we uh, play our fingertip on the top of a, a letter for example like a okay this is what can happen okay this is so what, what i'm going to introduce you is the notion that the central nervous system by looking through many channels computes what your fingertip feel right as you know that it, i mean uh, uh, now for you in audience is, is blind so now for us uh, how does it express but the blind people can put a finger here reads tons of stuff tons of stuff right this is based on here so suppose this is this is your skin surface okay there's a letter you scan through and each circle here indicate a receptor field of one receptor so let's say messengers this is just an example a superficial okay if the size of a receptor field is this large once your fingertip touches the letter a here's what i'm going to actually what was the new i'm going to do so you put a finger here and what you bring no bruno does not see the thing, uh, letter bring your brain read from a fiber here a connect here so this is what your brain read your brain read that these neurons receptors become activated because they happen to overlap with this letter this is what your brain read and so that's what a blind person's brain reads about the letter being a or otherwise okay now depends on the size of receiver field now if your receiver field is small naturally just like your camera with higher resolution you can quote read or touch the letter more clear if your receiver field is large you cannot do this okay now immediately you know why we discuss the receiver field among the lecture and some superficial receiver field uh, becomes very small and they are likely used to do this kind of a task now here's a here's experiment um, a research here at hopkins have done uh, to to test this idea okay so what is it done here is the following they have a will with uh, engraved uh, um, um, the letters here and uh, and train a monkey to pu put your finger here and because it's, it's, it's very hard to train animals say, okay, go read with your fingers. But you can train animals say, put a finger here. And you have this drum rotated through the finger. So it's, it's basically, effectively, uh, monkey's finger fills the letters. And then after one rotation, you move 200 microns this way. So without moving finger, basically the fingertip goes through all that letters, row by row. Okay? And here are the action potentials, spikes that researchers record from one of the peripheral nerves with slowly adapting, right? This is slowly adapting, this is a rapid adapting. Remember last time we talked about a rapid adapting in beings that response at the beginning when there's an edge, then stop when there's a flat surface. The slower adapting does the opposite. Okay, there are two types of fibers here based on their property response. So what you can see here is that, uh, of course, it depends how fast it is to rotate. If you rotate it with this speed, then cellular adapting neurons will give you an image like this, when A, B, and C was touched, touched upon by the fingertip. And rapid adapting will give you this, okay? That's because if you look carefully, each dot here is action potential that we talk about many, many times in this class. These neurons respond to age, only age. So there are blank spaces, there is no firing. Whereas these neurons respond to sustain a portion of this, but less so age. Okay. Now, this is a picture. Let me give you an even more uh, example of this. So this is an example now close to what blind people, the brain would see from a fingertip. So now uh, you run your finger through, okay, through raised uh, braille letters, you know, like here. And here's a several type of uh, receptors firing. Now, uh, does anyone still remember Piccini we talked about last time? Piccini receptor is deep in the finger here. They have a very large receptor field. Re responsible vibration with the highest sensitivity, about two, three hundred hertz. Okay, if you look at these neurons, you cannot tell anything about here. Okay, whereas if you look at these type of neurons, this is slow adapting. You know, if you compare here, here, one to one, you almost can read out. It turns out, a sh or a, a, you know, a save a lot of detail. It turns out, 
after all the analysis you can do quantitatively, people can conclude that the slowly dipping neuron with the mercury or so are likely the ones that are responsible for reading out those dots. But now the Pacini. Okay. Remember, we said at the very beginning of my lecture, uh, action potential or spikes are information carrier in the nervous system. Everything our brain knows, what do we hear, what do we see, what do we feel, what do we touch, all through action potentials. And here are the action potential patterns for the brain to read what the fingertip touches. Okay? And here, we can differentiate these two types of neurons. Okay? So, what research have learned for many years of work is that both the form and the texture perception depends on the spatial code. The spatial code means that how, how this each dot is represented in the, by different space in, in, the, in, in, the, in the neural firing. Now, there's one experiment for us to link them. So here, I, largely the hand waving. I did not give you evidence how this pattern and is a link to how one feels through fingertip. And you can do the following. You can do psychophysical experiments as we taught at the beginning of the class. The design experiment to ask a subject to tell how close two dots are, whether you can tell this pattern being different from this or that. Then you can do the same experiment, but now record the neurons from each of those fibers. Then you can compare them side by side, see which neurons the firing gave you best match to a subject's reporting of those dots. Okay, that is the psychophysical physiology combined. Okay? So here is a psychophysical experiment people designed to do. Okay? So in order to do this, you have to quantify stimuli. If I give you a letter A, B, C, D, now you will know all of you have gone through probability class. These are deterministic events. It's actually hard for you to tell what A different from B. A different from, different from B in many, many ways. Too many ways for you to tell. So the way research did this experiment is by design array of those dot patterns that vary by size, dot diameters, so small, medium, large. And it's a spacing, okay? Close, sparse, very far away, separate, okay? Now imagine yourself, you put your finger, if this is engraved in, in, a, in a piece of hardwood or metal, imagine yourself with take your fingertip, run through here, okay? Imagine what your sensation would be, right? What would be your sensation when you touch this part, just intuitively? What would be your sensation? What, how do you feel? Think about it. If you, if you touch something like this, smooth or rough? Yeah. What? Proper rough. But how about this compared here? Which one's rougher? Right, correct. So this one is rougher than here. What about here? Too sparse, so you not feel. That's exactly what a human being, human subject will show if we were to do the task. So here's data. So if you ask a subject in that experiment I just did verbally, and ask a subject to evaluate perceived roughly, so it's higher, is rougher than, than the dot spacing. Dot spacing is parameter along the direction. You find that most, most human subjects would scale somewhere in the middle, three, four millimeter space and being most rough. On this side, is the least rough means they feel smooth, right? If those dots are closer, closer, eventually just continuous surface, right? This is very much like, remember the first, first, first homework I give you guys, when you have generated pauses, bop, bop, Ba, 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 right, very, very fast. Now, the version of auditory version of this, on the one extreme, you feel is continuous. Continuous is is analogy of surface being very smooth. Okay, in the middle here, roughness is analogy for what we hear pitch in the audition. Then, by the time you reach here, you feel that discontinuous. You don't perceive them in the unit form. So that's why this curve goes up. Well, from smooth, rough, and come down. Okay, this is this way. Okay, now this is psychophysics. Now, how do you link this to neurophysiology? Well, you can repeat that experiment. Now, you record from neural fibers. Repeat that experiment, those dot patterns, 
and we recorded from several type of neurons. Again, in this experiment, given these patterns, roughly speaking, you pretty much can conclude that these neurons, slowly adapted neurons, perhaps reflect this pattern more accurately than definitely than Puccini, right? This, you really don't see any pattern over here. And this is a little bit uh, fuzzy. Okay, so this is kind of analysis that research has done to, uh, to conclude which type of, of receptors and fibers are involved in the form and the texture perception. Okay. Now, uh, we talk about this is all in the here. We call it peripheral nerve. Okay. And the equivalence of this in an artery system is artery nerve. Okay. Then we also talk about the notion of a central nervous system. And in the somatosensory system, there are several stages eventually you reach a place called the cortex. And uh, let's jump to several stages. Let's look at how the cortex responded to the same thing we just talked about. Okay? So here's the somatosensory system. For, from the beginning, from your muscle receptors or skin receptors, goes to spinal cord. As spinal cord goes continue, eventually uh, arrive somewhere to our central nervous system. So I show several sections here indicate a different part of your body that connects a different part of the spinal cord. If you continue there, you come through trigeminal ganglions, you arrive in this nuclei, and then the ones that we talk about a lot above here is the thalamus. It's called a ventral posterior middle nuclear of thalamus. Okay. Uh, but don't worry about the, uh, the, the, the acronym. It's actually called a VPN. I promise to you, our, the exam will not ask you to recite the name. But you ought to know that this is part of a somersensory thalamus. The auditory thalamus, the visual thalamus. Okay, for your information, auditory thalamus is called a medial genetic portion. Visual thalamus is called a lateral genetic. And the somersensory is called a ventral posterior medial. Okay, but that's okay. But there are some that are actually next door to each other, okay, right here. Okay. From here, it goes to a station called primary somatosensory cortex. And then we were talking about the equivalent of this in the system is a primary auditory cortex. In your visual system, area 17 is a primary visual cortex. Okay. So basically, for three major sensory systems, thalamus and the primary cortex are, are mirror message, mirror pictures. But what below thalamus to all the way to the peripheral, every system is different. By now, you should have appreciation what is different this is. Okay. But from here on, it's similar. Now, let's focus on here. This is the primary sensory cortex. If you look up here, it's somewhere here. If you expand here, thalamus come here into a layer. And this area, if we plot here by color, it is further separate. Primary somatosensory cortex is further separate into area 1, 3B, A, 2. Okay. Why we have so many? Okay. We, we won't have time to go through all of them, but, but I want to contract this to, to visual cortex, V1. In visual cortex, if you remember the lecture Dr. Ed Connor gave you, how many areas can you subdivide V1? How many? Zero, one, two, three. How many? Is there something? Are there areas underneath A1? V1? What's the name? No. I'm trying to check. No. V1 is V1. Okay. V1 does that. What about A1? No. A1 is A1. In the somatic sensory cortex, this is differentiation. All those red areas together are called S1. So my sensory cortex, why is separated here? This goes back to what we talk about, it, what's different in the fingertip. Fingertip have different receptors. The ones we say about the cutaneous touch, lightly touch, you take a Q-tip, you loosen the carton, you lightly scratch how you feel. That's the surface. Then you squeeze your hand a little bit, you feel. That's in deep, right? It turns out that superficial feel, that touch, is represented all the way here, 3B. The squeeze of something on your fingertip, that touch is 3A. Then there are other things. Okay, so, so the reflection, uh, the, this air organization being more diverse than A1 and V1 is a reflection of the diversity of receptors underneath your fingertip. 
Okay? Now, those blue areas are the secondary cortex, that information process here and goes here, goes here. Okay? Now, um, this is a summary of this, what I said, just said. The primary somatic sensory cortex, S1, contains those four areas. Then there's S2. Okay? And I, I like to really, I, I, I said many times that I really is expect all of you, after going through this class, being able to connect it and all the system, but now remember one system or another, because you are going to forget that very soon. The best way to learn this and appreciate this after this whole semester is being able to connect all the sensory system and the motor system. So towards the end of the semester, we'll go back to review that and talk about sensory motor integration, which we haven't treated them now. Okay? I just want to bring up this um, uh, notion that uh, you need to connect them. And this is something that our TAs will help you in the review sessions. And you ought to keep this in mind that all of these things are connected. They're not absolutely separate. They're part of the brain, even though we give lectures system by system. Okay. Now, um, another thing we talk about here is, is how the brain is organized to represent this finger. Okay. So I said to you earlier that if you look at our finger, small recipe field, bigger recipe field, even bigger one. Right? And our mouse face representative seem to be different. Okay. But how is that in the brain? Okay. Why this is small and has, has a representation in the brain different from here? So what people did is that many decades ago, uh, people did experiment in, in both animals and in real situations, they were able to measure in human subjects in a surgical room when they have to do medical preparations. Okay. So what they found is the following. So if you look, this part of the brain is a somatosensory cortex S1 Let's see, let's pick up one. Let's see area one, that's blue, okay? 3B, this yellow, okay? And when I was supposed, I, I told you last time that uh, for those of you uh, who missed it here, this lecture, uh, some sensory system were used to be given by Dr. Steve Xiao, uh, who is a long-term, a long-time instructor for the class. Dr. Xiao passed away two years ago, very sadly. And if you look at it, uh, my handout, I gave the tribute to Dr. Uh, Dr. Xiao, who gave a lecture for really 10, 15 years. And I also told you, I actually had credential to teach this. I wasn't joking, because when I was a postdoc, postdoc fellow in the UCSF, um, I actually studied some sensory system, recorded many, many neurons from these areas. Okay. Now, if we look at these areas, so the question is, which body part map into this? So remember, remember, this is not a real trivial. So if, if you, I grab someone here, say, close your eye, then I touch any part of your body, you immediately know which part is being touched. Now, how does your brain know? How does the brain know? You think about this, right? We, we told you, your brain only rely on this. How, how would you know? How would you know which part of your body is being touched? That's because your brain keeps a map of this, okay? Your brain keeps a map. That is, this part of your brain is responsible for your skin. Now, another thing of the reason this is not being trivial is that if you look at our skin surface of our body, it's not one dimensional, it's a three dimensional, right? If I could say part of your body surface on another wall, two dimensional, it's a hard problem. How do you get a three dimensional part here? And then your brain does not s store this three dimensional image so you know which part of your body is touched. The brain store all of your body skin parts along this strip of a cortex we call S1. And here, here's evidence, okay? So if you look here, let's just take the uh, blue ones, area one, okay? So it turns out the trunk is here, neck, elbow, hand, fingers, you know, thumbs, nose, face, okay? Keep, keep on that. So how do people find this out? The, the way research find this out is that they use microelectrodes, very fine needles, insert here, find it around, then go to search every party, every part of the body, skin, until they find a place they can define that recipe field we talk about. And it turns out that here, they, they find that in the trunk, here they find out the thumb, and so far so on. That's how they establish it. So now we know there's a map. Basically, it's right here in this slide. Every one of us has this switch of our brain that cover our entire body through neurons, okay? So, now, another thing we notice is that not every part of your skin is equally represented in the brain. Here is a cartoon to show that. 
This shows how big part of the brain is devoted to a particular finger, particular skin surface. For example, your hand takes this much, this much brain. Your, your foot only takes this much. Okay. Now, immediately you recall the receptive field that we talk about the being here being small, here being large. So that's a reverse relationship. The smaller receptive field your skin high, particular skin surface has, the larger representation the brain has. Why is that? That's because of evolution, through evolution, we use this more. Okay, we use this to find grab, to touch, to write. We we only use this to walk, right? Unless you lose here. So we, do, we really don't use our toes that much. So that's a reflection of that biological evolution. Okay. Now here is original data. Actually, people showed this. Dr. Shanamir, uh, given motor system, must have you have seen this before, right? Motor system, no? Okay, so, so there's an equivalent the part of a sensory motor. So what you can see here, this is that strip we talk about here. So this blue thing from the top to here is mapped from here to here. Now you can see every body part is here. Okay, so quite often students also wonder why our lips is so big in our brain? Well, you think about this. So why lips are so big? Far bigger than other parties. And our part is very big is, is, is our fingertip. That's right. Our trunk, our back, I think this, even though this physically counts for this big part, in the brain actually counts a little, just a little bit. So this orderly mic, we call it sensory homunculus. Okay. Now, in the motor system, which is a mirror image of this, has something similar, but not exactly like it. The order is roughly the same, but proportion is different. Now, hand representation here, proportionate is even bigger than this, okay? So, so this gets to the question, what happens? So this is one of the subjects I want to bring out today, we have not touched upon, is that I've told you um, two important concepts so far through uh, auditory somersensory system and visual system as well. That is, uh, our sensation to the external world is based on our receptors. That's one, right? Whether you feel something touch, feel vibrations are still here. That's one. The second principle, yes? Sorry, on the last slide, yeah. maybe it was two slides ago, one more. Yeah. On this one, so yeah. I understand that S1 is skin and then like S2 is like things that are on the interior. No, no, uh, no, no. Is that not how that works? No, no, uh, let me, let me call it, maybe, I, no. So what uh, is, what's the difference Good, 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 very good question. I jump through, uh, through here. So S1 with, S1, you pick up one area of S1, let's say area one. That's a subset of, that's a sub area of S1. That area, area represents the entire skin body, body parts. So every body parts is represented in here. Now the difference between here, and also every part of your skin is represented 3B. In difference in this, in 3B, you represent the superficial touch. In, in 3A, you represent the deep. One and two is something else. It's a little complex, so, so I, let's see. Let me give you two examples. 3B is a surface, 3A is deep. So that means it's the same skin, same skin location. Let's say this finger, hip, here. There are multiple stuff here, right? There's superficial touch, little bit of pressure, there's, there's other things all down the same surface. That, those are mapped individually into different area. Now, what does a, a sensory area secondary do, SO2? So we won't have, have time to discuss detail, but the general idea is just like a visual system. You have V1, V2, V4, MT. So this is some sensory layer. So S1 represents the skin surface. But we haven't talked about when you feel something that has particular shape, how do you calculate it here? This is not calculated in S1. So calculation, uh, like a computation like this, is probably carry, likely carried out in S2 and other areas above this. So we call those higher somersensory areas. Okay. okay, is that clear? Yes. Very, very good question. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about in the next slides. 
that is talking about plasticity. So that what happens, so I, I said I have talked about two principles. One is that you have different receptors that define modality of your feel. Second, that your cortex is organized in a map so that you know which body part is being touched. Or in a frequency domain of audition, you know whether low and high frequency. But, but this organization is not sitting in a stone. One of the most important discoveries scientists have made in the last half century is that these things moves. The moves as we learn, as we experience. And that this notion that, that in, in the development in children, infants, is, is people accept it. But actually, only about 30 years ago, people realized, even in our adult brain, in your brain, my brain, my, I'm a little older than you, but in all our brain, our brain constantly undergo changes. Here is the experiment to prove that. And the summer sensory is, is the system that tests that. Okay. So what is the notion of plasticity that I'm going to introduce here? So plasticity refers to the relative long-lasting modification in neural responses that accompany changes in the environment. So the way, a different way, you use your hand. For example, if you are a violin player, you use your hand all the time. Representation of your finger is different than from someone like myself. I don't play violin. Okay, people have done this, and also there is a topographic change in the summer sensory representation in that case. Now, this plasticity can be observed in these conditions. One is normal learning, as for example, you you learn how to drive, learn how to play tennis, learn how to play music instrument, and also response to injury. That's the example I'll give it to you. Okay, so here is the experiment that uh, people have done to prove this. First of all, you have local organization of a summer sensory cortex in closer uh, uh, relationship with others. Okay? Now, if you look one of the skin surface, map receiver field, okay? each of those over here represent a receiver field. Now, we, we, these are receiver field of neuron in the S1. Okay? So you drop an electron in S1, Record, you touch fingertip on your map, that's this, okay? This is a slow adapting receiver field and a rapid adapting receiver field. And what does it mean the following? This is a map, we just talked about 3B, a different skin surface. This is a finger, fourth finger, you enlarge here, they can separate it by two types of neuron. Okay, that's the organization we begin with, okay? And then people did the following experiment. So what happened to this map? if one or more of your fingers is gone. Okay. So for example, if you have accent, okay, don't practice this at home, so I have a good with this camera. If you have accent, one finger, boom, is gone. What happened to this, right? Because what I told you here, it's very clear your finger, one, two, three, four, five, is all mapped here. What if this finger is gone because, because accent is gone here? What happened to the brain, right? This is what happened to the brain. This is one experiment that's very important. This is one of the very most important experiments done in the 1980s, in the middle 80s, I think, I think before you guys were born, right? Okay, good, good. So every year, you guys get younger and younger. Every year, I talk to her, I check my writing. When I started teaching, the student in my class started teaching her in 95. This experiment was done in 1984, all right? So when I started teaching students in this class, when this experiment done, was 10 years old. Okay, well, maybe there's a, now, now you're over. So that's very interesting. So, so this is what the experiment done, okay? Of course, you cannot do this in humans. So people tested in, in animal model that you surgically remove one finger. Here's what happened, okay? What happened, because this is a, a situation where many humans unfortunately run into an in accident in the factories. People finger get cut off all the time, you know, before the modern techniques, te technology takes over. So, in a normal animal representation of fingers, you have one, two, three, four, five. Okay. If finger three is gone, amputated two months, there's of course no three. But what you notice here, just the question you asked me earlier, that finger two and four takes over. Okay. So brain does not sit in there quietly. Neurons are activated. So when the input to this is gone, other is take over. Okay. Now, this is one of the perhaps most elegant experiments to test this. And this happened to be from my doctorate and the postdoctoral work. Because after the earlier experiment in the 80s, people said, well, after all, you surgical removal here, many things can happen. You have nerve damage. Then we did this experiment. We take animal, we train animal to use fingers because 
monkeys like humans use finger independent. You guys have noticed here, right? If you, if you get a rat, do you ever see how rats eat stuff? Rats just like this. They don't use fingers. This is a primate that humans include, special with fingers. So we basically train, I train the animal, so not use the finger independent, but use three fingers. Same time, again and again. Many, many, hundreds of times a day. But we didn't do anything with the finger. Also train the animal to pull the finger and feel vibration. Then after several months of training, what we find is the representation of those three fingers are connected. Okay. So they prove one important point, that how our brain is organized depends how our finger service is used. Okay. And uh, since my time is off, the weather is so nice outside. So I'll stop here, and I'll come back towards the end of the semester to finish a little bit here and uh, talk about sensory motor integration. If anyone has a question, you can stand here. Okay, see you guys.